Welcome to the Pleasant Green Missionary Baptist Church Sunday School lesson for Sunday, November 21st, 2021. I am Reverend Mary Tillman, and I am your presenter for today. Our fall quarter study is Celebrating God. We're in Unit 3, Visions of Praise. This is lesson number three in unit number three. The lesson title in the Townsend Press Sunday School Commentary is Rejoicing in Heaven. The lesson title in the Faith Pathway Bible Studies for Adults is Family Restored. Our devotional reading, Revelation 5 verses 1 through 14. Our key verse is the seventh verse of the 19th chapter of Revelation. From the NIV Bible, it reads, Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory, for the wedding of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. And that's Revelation 19, verse number 7 from the NIV Bible. Let us pray. Father God, Thank you for the opportunity to study your holy word. Please open our understanding so that we may rejoice and give you glory and unity with a committed spirit of love and fellowship, and then practice your teachings in our daily lives. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. This lesson series from the book of Revelation offers a bird's eye view of extraordinary moments of worship. The images of heavenly worship are enough to inspire those who live in this world to seek to create more joyous moments in their worship experiences. In John chapter 4, verse 24, Jesus said, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. That's from the New King James Version. Saying that God is spirit means that God is an immaterial, invisible living reality. No one can see or touch God because he is spirit. This allows God to be in all locations at the same time, meaning there is nowhere you and I can go to escape the presence of God. God is everywhere at the same time. This is known as his omnipresence, and it is a fundamental trait of God's character. So no matter where we go or what we do, God is always there. So that means whenever we need him, just know he's present. Remember, Jesus said, I will never leave you or forsake you. So he's always with us, no matter where we go. So get your Sunday school book, your Bible, a pen and notepad, and follow along as we go forward with this lesson. Let's get started. There are three questions to consider. One, what was the multitude in heaven singing and shouting about? Number two, who is referred to as the great prostitute or harlot in this week's lesson? And number three, what does the metaphor of the marriage, the lamb and the bride represent? Let's look at the lesson's biblical context. The book of Revelation is the last inspired book of the Bible and in the New Testament. It is written by the Apostle John while he was exiled on the Isle of Patmos. The purpose of the book is to reveal events which will take place immediately before, during, and following the second coming of Christ. Jesus revealed God's plan for the end of the world to John in a vision, allowing him to see, write, and record certain events. The things that John sees are all in heaven. In chapter 18, the city of Babylon and all it stood for is finally overthrown. What follows in chapter 19 is a vision of the celebration in God's presence a vision both heard and seen by John. The 19th chapter of Revelation is generally given the heading, The Battle of Armageddon. John wrote this section of the Revelation after witnessing God's destruction of Babylon. 
The first half of chapter 19 is devoted to a scene in heaven that features a large multitude singing hallelujah and victory and praise to the Lord. The great multitude celebrates the defeat of the world's kingdoms and proclaims the Lord's universal reign. In this week's lesson, the kingdom of Satan is referred to as the kingdom of this world, and the kingdom of God is represented by contrasting images of women. The kingdom of this world, who is Satan, is pictured as a great prostitute And we see this in Revelation chapters 17 and 18. On the other hand, the kingdom of Christ is pictured as a virtuous bride prepared for her husband. And we see this in Revelation 19 verses 7 and 8. Okay, let's dive into the study of the lesson. This week's lesson's aims are, as a result of experiencing this lesson, You should be able to do these things. One, discuss the implications of God's judgment for believers. Two, believe that God's judgment is inclusive of his justice and mercy. And three, affirm, receive, and enjoy the love of Christ for all and anticipate the completion of God's plan at the end of this age. There are two lesson outlines in the Adult Pathway Sunday School book. I will share two key points from each of these outlines and expound some on each of them. The first outline is Hallelujah, Rejoice. That's in Revelation chapter 19, verses 1 through 4. The second outline is Heavenly Rejoicing, And we'll find that in Revelation chapter 19, verses 5 through 8, which encompasses our lesson scriptures for today's lesson. Let's look at outline number one. Hallelujah, rejoice. Revelation 19, 1 through 4, the verses read, After this, this is John speaking, After this, I heard what sounded like the roar of a great multitude in heaven, shouting, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and power belong to our God. For true and just are his judgments. He has condemned the great prostitute who corrupted the earth by her adulteries. He has avenged on her the blood of his servants. And again they shouted, Hallelujah. The smoke from her goes up forever and ever. The 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God who was seated on the throne and they cried, Amen, Hallelujah. Chapter 19 begins the transition from the previous chapter with after these things, moving from the destruction and downfall of Babylon to the defeat of the beast once and for all. Babylon refers to a system not an actual city. It represents an antichrist empire. It refers to a kingdom that has great similarity to Old Testament Babylon. Verse 1 reads, After this I heard what sounded like the roar of a great multitude in heaven shouting, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and power belong to our God. Key point number one, in a vision, John heard the loud voice of a great multitude in heaven. Who was this multitude? John did not reveal the identity of this massive multitude of saints. They sing praises to the name of the Lord, saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. God is praised for three of his greatest attributes, salvation, glory, and power. Salvation, the Greek word for that is soteria, meaning to deliver from harm or to preserve alive from danger. The other attribute, glory, the Greek word for that is doxa, 
has in it the idea of magnifying or exalting. And the third attribute, power, the Greek word for that is dunamis, it denotes the inherent capacity to perform or produce results. In verse 2, there are three reasons why God is worthy of such enthusiastic praise. First, his judgments are true and righteous. God is praised because in the end he will do what is right for those who have been faithfully committed to the kingdom of his dear son, Jesus Christ. Second, God is praised because he has judged the great harlot for corrupting the earth with her immorality. And third, God is praised because he has avenged the blood of the martyred saints. Key point number two. There is a second round of acclamations of praise to God. In verse 3, God is praised because Rome is permanently destroyed. And in verse 4, as in the previous settings of the 24 elders and four living creatures falling down prostrate before the throne, that's an act of humility and reverence for the one who sits on the throne. We see that in the midst of the coming of judgment and the pouring out of the wrath of God upon the wicked, worship continues to take place. In other words, saints, we must praise God when things are going well and when storms of life are raging. David tells us that we should bless the Lord at all times and his praise should continually be in our mouths. So praise goes on regardless of what the situation is going on around us. Outline number two, heavenly rejoicing. And we find that in Revelation 19 verses five through eight. And it reads, then a voice came from the throne saying, praise our God, all you his servants, you who fear him, both great and small. Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters and like loud peals of thunder shouting, Hallelujah, for our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory, for the wedding of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. And denote here that fine linen stands for the righteous acts of God's holy people. Key point number one. Shortly after the chorus of praise breaks out in heaven, a voice echoes from the throne of God, calling upon all the saints on the earth to praise the Lord. We see that in verse number five. Who are these saints on the earth? Opinions are divided, but one thing is certain. John saw a great multitude of worshipers on this earth. The voice summons those present to praise our God. Our God is to be distinguished from the gods of the Romans and the Greeks. John saw a time when the people of God will celebrate the true and living God. These are his servants and those who fear him. Those who fear God give him praise. Now, fear is not to be taken as a sense of deep dread and apprehension, but it is a word that denotes reverence, deference, and respect. John saw a community of believers made up of people from all nations and peoples of the earth. This community of worshipers are all the same, and the barriers that have divided the people of God will finally be prominently broken. See Galatians 3, 28, and also Ephesians 2, verses 14 and 16. John wrote that the praise of the people of God sounded as though it were a single voice. God is almighty and no power in heaven or earth is greater. John points out several important lessons for us. First, God is the only one to be worshipped. And we see that in Exodus 20 and 3, one of the Ten Commandments. 
Second, worship is a community event wherein the people of God celebrate the acts of God. It is the right and privilege of all God's people. Psalms 148. It's a great psalm. You should read that. Again, that's Psalms 148. And third, worship celebrates the salvation, power, and glory of God, who does great and marvelous things. True worship is a noisy event, punctuated by loud manifestations of joy and excitement. Let's see what Psalm 95 verses 1 through 6 says about worship. It says, Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great king above all gods with a little g. In his hand are the depths of the earth and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his for he made it and in his hands formed the dry land. Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. This is what worship, praise, and honor is all about. Key point number two, the marriage of the lamb. Verses seven and eight of chapter 19 reads, Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory, for the wedding of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. Verses 7 and 8 describe the relationship between Jesus Christ and his church. John called upon the people to rejoice and be glad because the marriage of the Lamb has come. In addition, the bride has done all the things necessary to prepare herself for this great day. Appearing in the finest garments of fine linen, clean and white, denoting purity and without blemish. The bride of Christ is cleansed from all corrupt desires and unrighteousness. As believers, we are cleansed of all unrighteousness by the blood of Jesus Christ. Through the washing of regeneration, we are made fit to be partakers with all the saints in light. And we see this in Titus 3, verse number 5. In summary, my brothers and sisters, God calls us into a relationship with himself and his son. We should constantly examine our hearts to determine our place within the plan of God. Ask yourself, am I positioned rightly with God's plan for me? Self-examination is always a great exercise. Worship is always to be given to God alone. Worship should never be given to an individual, a nation, or an ideal. That, my friend, is idolatry. According to scripture, we should appreciate and respect our spiritual leaders, but never, ever worship any individual. Remember, Christ is coming back for his bride, the church, one that is without spot or wrinkle. We must prepare ourselves to meet the Lord. Well, that's our lesson for today. Let's prepare to meet the Lord. I want to be ready when Jesus comes. I don't know about you, but I'm busy getting my house in order. And I admonish you to get your house in order for he's on his way back because he said he was coming back for his church that is without spot or wrinkle. John 14, Jesus said, I'm going away to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. So if we want to go back with him, we must start preparing now to meet the Lord when he comes back. Because I can promise you the word of God is true. And I believe, I truly believe the Lord is on his way back as we speak. 
I hope you got a thought out of the lesson. Let us pray. Father God, we look forward with expectancy to the day when the bride and groom will be together. Until that day, may we remain faithful, pure, and holy. May we look with hope toward the future. We thank you for this lesson reminding us that we are washed in the blood of the Lamb and we are preparing ourselves and we should be preparing ourselves to meet you when you return. Thank you, thank you for this eye-opening lesson. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.